Um, with that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, State Senator Mark Herring, who's running for Attorney General. Good afternoon. Hey, Mark. How are you? Uh, well, first of all, it is great to be here, and uh, uh, I absolutely love uh, serving in the in the state capitol. But it is awfully nice to be back home. So it's good to see you all, and thank you for giving me a little time to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about why I'm running for attorney general and why your support is so critical for next year. Uh, now, many of you uh, I've known from campaigns over the years, uh, but I thought I'd take a few minutes first to give you a little bit of information about my background, and, uh, and then I'll go into why I'm running for Attorney General and why your support's so critical. Um, as most of you know, I grew up in Loudoun County. Uh, my, my parents divorced when I was young, so I was pretty much raised by my mom and my sister. And uh, from that experience, I know firsthand what it's like when the laws that are supposed to be protecting people aren't working. Uh, our child support enforcement laws then weren't what they are today. And so that was a formative experience at that early age about what happens when laws aren't working well. Uh, but as I said, pretty much raised by my mom and my sister, and through a lot of hard work, working construction, uh, running a jackhammer during the summers, and odd jobs at restaurants, and some Pell Grants and student loans, I made it through college at UVA, uh, earned my law degree from Richmond, and then I went back home to Leesburg where I grew up because I wanted to establish my law practice uh, and raise my family in the same hometown where I grew up. Uh, and my wife, Laura, and I have been married for 23 years. We're, we've got two children. Uh, our daughter is a second year student at UVA. Uh, my son is, uh, our son is a uh, junior at Loudoun County High School. And I'll just say this one thing about him. Um, basketball is the central focus in his life right now. <laughs> He's 6'4", and unlike his father, he's very good. Um, and uh, uh, I got involved in politics really at the local level. Uh, after a few years of practice, uh, I decided that I could get more involved in the community and ran for county supervisor. And uh, I ran against a six-term incumbent Republican mayor who had never lost a race before, and I won. And then, and then uh, and some of you remember the 2006 special election when I ran for the Senate. Some of you probably helped out on that campaign. Special elections are sort of all hands on deck, and folks from all over Northern Virginia pitched in. And uh, we, we ended up winning every single precinct in 2006, then re-elected in 2007 and 2011. And I first started thinking about running for Attorney General uh, very soon after our current Attorney General took office. Um, you know, he, he, has, he has bent and twisted the law in order to try to advance an extreme agenda that appeals to a very narrow part of the spectrum and to advance his own political ambitions. And that is an abuse of the powers of the office. And if you look at the Republicans who are lining up to run, uh, they are just the same way. They think he's done a good job. And, and that, that uh, the way he's run the office is really a model to follow. If, so if that isn't scary enough, uh, they would do the same thing he's done. And the Office of Attorney General is a, is a very visible office. It's a very powerful office. The right person in that office can do a lot of good for a lot of people. And heaven knows we know what happens when the wrong person's in there. And I've got the right experience, the right know-how to repair the damage he's done and to fight for the values that we all share. And you know I'm fighting for the values. I will fight for the values we all share. You see me doing it every day. Uh, in the General Assembly right now, I've got legislation in to help implement the Affordable Care Act here in Virginia. There are two pieces to that. 
there are two pieces to that. The first piece is legislation that would establish uh, an exchange in partnership with the federal government. Now, the governor last year killed our effort to establish a Virginia exchange, but the next best thing would be a partnership because we know the, the insurance markets, the sub-markets here in Virginia, we know the needs of the people and the patients, we know the health care delivery system in Virginia, so we're in a much better position to help uh, guide and, and shape the exchange to best fit the needs of the people in Virginia. The second piece to that is expanding Medicaid, and I'm co-sponsor of a budget amendment that would expand Medicaid. It would make health coverage available for hundreds of thousands of Virginians who currently can't afford it. It would, it would bring an infusion of dollars to our uh, health care delivery system in Virginia. So it's a win-win, and, and we are fighting every day to try to get that implemented this session. I've also carried legislation for voting reforms. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with Congressman Connolly and Senator Warner's uh, voting legislation now, now pending in Congress to encourage states to simplify their uh, registration process and to speed up voting at the polls so they don't have to wait so long. You remember what happened in Prince William. People waited three hours in line to vote. There were precincts in Virginia Beach where people were waiting five hours. And that, that is a form of voter disenfranchisement. We can do better than that. And what, what that legislation would have done is to help do the things that Congressman Connolly and Senator Warner were trying to encourage states to do, to simplify registration, make voting easier. Well. One of the Republicans running for Attorney General was chair of the committee where that bill was heard. He scheduled the hearing for 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon with very little discussion, led the effort to defeat it on a party line vote. So we're working to try to expand people's ability to, to vote and make it easier while they're in there trying to make it harder. So voting reforms, uh, implementing the Affordable Care Act in Virginia, also had legislation that would repeal the, uh, the onerous and unnecessary regulations on women's health centers that, that could cause them to close. And it's shocking, it is shocking what, what, what the opponents, what, what, what both Republicans running for the Office of Attorney General voted for. They voted to make it harder for women to access health care. They, they made it more expensive. And it's shocking that they would do that. But that's what they're about. And so I am there fighting for the values we share, and that's what I'll do as Attorney General. And that's what I've been doing, that's what I've done in my law practice for almost 25 years. I did it as a county supervisor, I've done it as a state senator, and if you believe, and, and let me just say this, I, I mentioned being raised pretty much by my mom and my sister, and I'll say this about my mother, for a number of years she taught civics and, uh, and American history. One of the things she taught me was that in a representative democracy, if you don't like what your government's doing, you not only have the, the right, but the responsibility to change it. And if you believe, if you believe like I believe, that we need fundamental change in the office of Attorney General. If you believe, like I believe, that we've got the best chance to win back the office of Attorney General in years and years, if you believe we need to have our best team out on the field, that we need to put somebody to carry our banner who has been fighting in the trenches, who is battle-tested, who knows what it takes to win tough elections, then I ask that you join my campaign. I know I've got petitions going around. That's an easy way to get started. Uh, I think we'll have bumper stickers here, so it's never too early to have a Mark Herring for Attorney General bumper sticker on your car. And I urge you and, and ask you to please join me. Uh, and and if, if we come together, and I know with your energy and your enthusiasm that together, we can take back the Office of Attorney General 
and Virginia, for the first time in 24 years, will elect a Democrat to the office of Attorney General. And I'm told we've got some time for questions. Okay. Question? Sure. Mark, one correction. Prince William County, the last vote in Prince William County was cast at 10.46 p.m. Wow. Unacceptable. And like the President said, we got to fix that. Um, I just wanted to bring up the issue. I, I got here a little late. Well, talked about climate change. Oh, thank you. Did I talk about climate change? Uh, just uh, the biggest issue facing not just the state and the country, but the world is climate change. And it's difficult for people in Virginia to do, to get a lot of action against it because of the power of the, uh, the coal companies and the power of the utilities. Um, and we've seen what an activist attorney general can do to hassle people who are trying to do something about climate change. Is there anything that an enlightened attorney general can do to help advance action against climate change? Thank you. Good, good question. The answer is the attorney general can do a lot in that area. Now, first of all, we need to have an attorney general who believes in science. That's, that's the first step. Now, and, 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 and when, when Ken Cuccinelli went after uh, Mike Mann, the researcher at UVA, that was one of those that really, that really told me this is going to become a pattern with him. You know, sometimes there are gray areas in the law, but he has so manipulated the law, no reasonable attorney, in my view, could have reached the conclusion that the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act could be applied to use to, to basically persecute a researcher and and the attorney general did it because he disagreed with his ideas and his conclusions which is downright un-american it is so so number one we need to have an attorney general who 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 believes that a lot of what we're doing here um, on earth and on our planet uh, is affecting the climate and to take some responsible action and believes in science uh, we also need to send a message that's, that's the complete opposite of what he did. The message that that sent to people outside of Virginia was that we were a backward state, that we were anti-science, and here we are from an economic development standpoint trying to attract top researchers to Virginia's universities. We're trying to attract technology companies. Well, if you're a researcher who's thinking about bringing a research team to Virginia, why would you do that? If the attorney general is going to come after you and subpoena your data, you're not, or at least it's going to be, you know, you're not going to do it. So we need some. We need to have an attorney general who will try to attract uh, technology business and researchers. The other thing is, the attorney general's office uh, represents the people in, uh, in in before the state corporation commission when utilities uh, are are being regulated. So um, that's another area that the attorney general can do a lot on. Is, is in consumer protection and looking out for the people. And I've often talked about really the, the powers of the office in terms of its history. It started off, uh, the, the, the Office of Attorney General has a storied history and goes back to the courts of medieval England when the judge or, or the king figured out it's a good idea to have a lawyer to look after your property and your money. But then the, the job grew into protecting the king's interest all over. Uh, and then uh, when, when the United States was established and our forefathers founded this nation, the office of attorney general changed. And instead of protecting and defending the king's interest, it was to defend and protect the public interest. And that's what the attorney general does. The attorney general is the guardian of the public interest. And so, in, in proceedings before the state corporation commissions, when utilities are there, the attorney general represents the public interest. And the public has an interest in making sure that regulations are applied evenly and fairly, making sure that our environmental laws are being enforced. And those are the kinds of things that an attorney general can do. Thank you. Hi. Um, Pat Hines, how are you? I'm um, good, Pat. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> I had a question.
question about ex-offender voting rights. Um, I think Brigades has been somewhat involved, some of us, over the years on this. And you know, Virginia, along with Kentucky, brings up the rear nationally, the only two states that still require um, ex-felons to, uh, they, that you lose your voting right forever unless you proactively petition the governor to get it back. Now, um, apparently, this is one of the rare instances where I agree with Governor McDonald. Mm -hmm. He is proposing legislation that would return, I don't know the details, but it would return um, voting rights for nonviolent felons. I don't know where that legislation is right now. Um, I wanted to know just your feelings about that legislation, what happens, what you could do as Attorney General if it doesn't pass, and then I'm going to ask maybe a tougher question, which is what about violent felons voting rights? I want to know where you stand on that. Um, well, first the uh, question is about uh, where the, the automatic restoration of voting rights legislation is. And you're right, I, I think many of us were surprised that Governor McDonald announced that he was now supporting that. Uh, we were, we were uh, in, the, in the House chamber for the, the State of the Commonwealth Address when he did that, and, and you know, we started looking at each other like, did he just say what we think he said? And, and it was like, yeah, and so one third of the room stood up and, and started cheering and applauding, and the other two thirds of the room kind of sat there rather quietly. But, uh, and and uh, the House defeated that legislation very quickly in a subcommittee, uh, and I, and I co-sponsored the legislation in the Senate, uh, and I can't, I can't remember, if it, I think yeah, it has passed the Senate or it's out of the committee, I think it will pass if it hasn't. Um, Senator Yvonne Miller, who passed away last year, has been fighting for that for 20 years. And my feeling is if, uh, if a person who's convicted, they serve their sentence, supervised and unsupervised probation, make, make uh, 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 pay all their court costs and everything else, we expect them then to come out, become a responsible member of society, but we're not going to give them the right to vote. To me, that's a disconnect. If we want them to be a responsible member of society and participate in society and work, uh, then we need to make sure they have a stake in the government. So. I've supported that in the past. I'm going to continue to support it. The violent felons is a little tougher one, but again, I, I sort of come at it the same way. If they've served their sentences, served, you know, paid their debt to society, paid back all the court costs and restitution, if we're going to expect them to be responsible members of the, of the community, then they should have the right to vote. Senator Heron, I'm Carol Schreier Pollock, and I have a question about what's going on now in the Senate and the redistricting bill. Can you address that and also tell us what we can do now uh, to try to prevent its passage, and if it should pass and it's not vetoed, the role of the Attorney General's office if there's a suit regarding constitutionality? Yeah. And what do you think of the success of that? Okay. Um, I'm sure you all know what happened uh, on Inauguration Day in the General Assembly. Uh, Henry Marsh, who uh, had, had been uh, a civil rights leader, wanted to see that historic occasion when uh, Virginia made history a second time and, and re-elected Barack Obama, and so he went to the inauguration. There was a, set, there was a House bill that had nothing to do with Senate redistricting, that the 20 Republicans took advantage of his absence to slap on a whole new Senate redistricting plan onto that bill and vote it out. And they limited debate, first to 15 minutes, then to 30 minutes after they were called out on it, <laughs> gave us no warning, no notice, uh, had, had detailed descriptions of the different districts without any heads up. And historically, you need to know two things. First. The General Assembly has done work on uh, inauguration days in the past, but not on real controversial matters because no matter which uh, party the newly elected president belongs to, there are going to be some people who want to go. So there's work that we can do, but if it's real controversial, we, we haven't heard it. There's another tradition in the Senate. If a member is absent and a bill comes up that we know that member is going to want to be present for and be heard, it is part of the Senate custom and tradition
to pass that bill on to the next day when the member can be there and participate in it. That's a time-honored tradition. And what the, the Republicans did, they slapped that bill down. Everybody knew Senator Marsh would want to be there for that. With him there, it's 2020, and it doesn't, it doesn't pass. But they did it anyway. They limited debate to 30 minutes. Why? So he wouldn't have time to drive back down and vote. Now, when I went down uh, in the beginning of the session, I thought there were a lot of big issues, transportation, education, wanted to roll back some of the extreme things that got passed that Virginians were really upset with. And so we started to begin that dialogue and that discussion and that conversation. And imagine the strained relations and the, the broken trust when we thought we were negotiating about those issues and how we could find common ground and compromise. And in fact, in their minds, they were just plotting to wait for the right opportunity to redistrict the state. No legislature should ever do anything like that, let alone the Virginia Senate. Now, on the constitutionality, for, and what can you do? Right now, it's pending in the House, so you ought to contact as many House of Delegates members as you can and let them know how upset you are and how wrong you think it is so that they vote it down. The Speaker could rule it non-germane. The Governor has said it was a terrible thing that happened, but he hasn't promised to veto it, you can write to the governor and urge him if the House passes it to veto it, to rise above that kind of hyper-partisanship. If the House passes it, if the governor vetoes it, I am certain we will challenge it in court, and I feel confident we'll prevail, and here's why. The Constitution is very clear. Redistricting is done, in two, it says that, that, that the General Assembly shall redistrict in 2011 and every 10 years thereafter. And there's a reason why. You don't want to be doing this every year. And it, you don't want these lines changing constantly <coughs> if one member happens to be in the room or not. And this past Friday, one of the Republicans wasn't there. There were some bills, there were some close votes there uh, coming out of committee, part, straight party line votes. And consistent with that tradition, we went on and said, you know what? If we start pulling up all of those bills and voting them down that we don't like and passing the ones we did, then that tradition is over forever. And we need to take the high road and remind Virginians that there is a certain amount of decorum and trust that we have to have in the legislature. And so let, let your delegates know, let the governor know that that's unacceptable. And I saw my, I don't know if that, that yellow sheet meant three. <laughs> three. Okay, so probably time for one more question. Yes. Hi, Senator Herring. Uh, my name is Michael Angeloni. I, just, I want to thank you and the rest of the for being here today. This has just been wonderful. Um, the question that I have is, um, Virginia is one of, I believe it's 29 or 30 states where you can be legally let go from a position at your job for being LGBT. Um, and I want to know from you, uh, this is something, as, as Attorney General, you'll be you know, the highest lawyer in the land, so to speak, that you will be there to defend us, you know, so that because me and my fellow people who are LGBT should not have to fear going to work and possibly losing our jobs because yeah. they may find out we're LGBT. Yeah. Nobody deserves to be discriminated against. And I will use the full powers of the law to protect your rights. Um, and before I forget, and I'll, I'll give a little more detail to answer that, but before I forget, one of the things that the Attorney General could do on the redistricting is stand up and say that's unconstitutional <laughs> and, and say that, the, that this is unconstitutional and you shouldn't even finish the, the process of voting because it, you know, it's unconstitutional. So having an attorney general who will stand up and do those kinds of things is important. Likewise, on equality issues, uh, I support marriage equality. I have consistently voted for uh, legislation that would... Uh, prohibit discrimination in state employment, and I will use the powers of the office and the law to support your civil rights. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I encourage all of you to go to my website, www.
herring4, F-O-R-A-G.com. Sign up for email updates. Sign up and like my Facebook page. And uh, I hope to earn your trust and vote and support. And thank you for inviting me.